Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church. It's a little different circumstance and the fact that I'm videotaping this from home. Um, I just want to welcome each and every one of you that, uh, to this broadcast today. And uh, we've done a little, few things a little different today. I think you'll find it a, a blessing. Um, we've added more to our service time rather than just um, a sermon. And so uh, I'd love to get some feedback, uh, if things that you'd like to see us um, you know, add to it. But a couple things before we begin, I'll just take, take some time to share a few announcements. Um, the first one is that um, if you have any need uh, at the church here, please feel free to call the church, call Pastor Mike, the elders, the deacons. That's what we're here for. So if you have a need, please, please call us, one of us, and um, we will help you out any way we can. We hope this finds you all safe and healthy. Um, we uh, know that this is a trying time. A um, couple of things that I wanted to share with you is um, right before we went into this um, time where we had to cancel our service, the Life Choices Ministry had brought to our church all of the baby bottles for um, their annual fundraiser for the Crisis Pregnancy Center the, through Life Choices. And, and this is an opportunity for you, uh, if, if you'd like, they, they asked that instead of doing this baby bottle drive, if you would, were planning on giving or collecting um, for them, that if you would just would send it to them, you'd go onto their website and um, send them uh, your gift. A couple other things I need to share with you um, is ministry is still going on at here First Press. Uh, Brittany's been doing a lot of neat things with the children through an email that she's been sending out uh, during the week. And also Zach has been connecting with the youth too. Um, ministry goes on, but it's really kind of different at this point. What I'm going to ask a, a couple of things is that there's some needs. There's some needs with uh, Shepherd's Hand, with uh, the Lighthouse, Montrose Lighthouse Ministry. Um, they are serving in a much larger population at this time. The Montrose Lighthouse, which is a homeless center for um, those in our community, they are in stay in place right now. And the people that volunteer there that help are, are in need of masks. Um, same with Shepherd's Hand, they are finding themselves serving a lot more people. Um, not only uh, meals, but also in providing food. And uh, they also could use masks. Uh, Joann's here in town um, has kits to help make masks. My, my daughter Abigail shared a video with me today um, that shows a, a really neat way to make masks too. And I'm gonna encourage her to, to post that on our Facebook page for the church. So that's a need. You can contact uh, either uh, Chris Houck at the Lighthouse Ministries or Gary Martinez if you have uh, any questions or would like to help with them. Um, a couple other things that, that I want to share with you before we begin our service is um, what about people who have called and asked about how they can continue to give to First Presbyterian Church. We have chosen to keep our staff on payroll and paying them and uh, we just need to make sure that people are faithful in giving their tithes and offerings. And if you want to go to our website, you can, um, you can log in and uh, donate through that, or you can also send your tithe and offerings through the mail to First Presbyterian Church. Uh, this is a trying time, and we want to continue to be um, a light to our community. And so that's kind of an important part. The last thing I want to share with you is right now, um, Easter service is... Uh, is kind of up in the air at this point of how we're going to proceed. And so I really want you to be attentive to uh, your emails and our notices that we send out concerning next week's uh, service. Probably at this point in time, it will be done probably online like we've done in the past. So um, I hope this all finds you well and enjoy this service. Let me pray for us right now as we enter this time of worship. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we um, acknowledge, Lord God, this this circumstance we find ourselves in is just almost beyond our comprehension. Yet, Lord God, we can rest in the very assurance that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that, Lord God, that you, um, you love us and that you care for us. And, Lord God, I would pray that you instill that in us, Lord God, that we do not need to be afraid. We do not need to be fearful of this time, Lord God, but that we have an almighty God that we can trust in. 
that is faithful and that loves us. And we ask this in your most beautiful and most precious name, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In your precious name. So Gang and I are coming to you live from our home, but what we'd like to do is to use this time for us to participate in the call to worship for our service this Sunday. The words will be on the screen for you to follow along, and so please join us now as we enter into this time of worship. When Jesus approached the city of Jerusalem with many of his followers, he was riding a young colt of a donkey. People waved their palm branches and spread them on the road before him. The people all shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When Jesus rode by, some people even threw their cloaks down in front of the donkey colt, and they shouted, Hosanna! Glory to God in the highest. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we have a reading from Zechariah 9.9. 9, the coming of Zion's king. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's Palm Sunday, and it wouldn't be Palm Sunday without an appearance by our special young people. So here's a special treat to the whole church family from um, our youngest members. Thanks to Abby Stetson for putting it together. Amen. Hosanna. 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 Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mike Motzko, interim pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Montrose, Colorado. And I want to uh, wish everyone viewing a happy Palm Sunday. 
Glad you can join us. Thank you for watching in this time in God's Word. And allow me to begin our time of sharing in God's Word with a reading from the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. But the next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not yet the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, and they began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. On Palm Sunday, Christians the world over, numbering in the hundreds of millions, remember and celebrate the entrance of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem roughly 2,000 years ago. At that time, when, as we just heard from the scripture reading, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, there were thousands upon thousands of Jewish pilgrims from all over the world gathered there to celebrate the Feast of Passover and other feasts. The Jewish people had been doing so since the time of Moses, roughly 1,800 years prior to the time of Christ. And so Jesus and his followers enter into Jerusalem. It's thought he mounted the colt of a donkey on the Mount of Olives, went down uh, the Kidron Valley, and then up the hill that leads into um, the uh, city wall that is around Jerusalem, or was around Jerusalem at that time, and went through one of the gates. But on the way, many people, knowing that Jesus was entering into the city, congregated. And they began shouting and acclaiming him as the son of David, 
as the one blessed who comes in the name of the Lord. And they showed their homage to Jesus as a leader, as Messiah, possibly as king, by waving uh, branches, uh, likely from palms uh, gathered from nearby villages, and by throwing their cloaks down in front of the hoofs of the colt of the donkey. Some people wanted Jesus to take over the Roman occupation in Jerusalem and throughout Israel so that a son of David, and Jesus was a direct physical descendant of uh, King David, uh, the people wanted Jesus to become their king. That's not why Jesus went to Jerusalem for that Passover. In fact, he made it clear, saying many times, the Son of Man will be betrayed, he will be handed over, and will suffer and be crucified, but will rise from the dead. Uh, the resurrection, of course, is something Christians the world over will celebrate next Sunday on Easter Resurrection Sunday. But Jesus was entering the city. Jesus was ascending the hill to go into the city of Jerusalem, passing through the gates of the city. And people had heard about Jesus. They heard about this rabbi carpenter from Nazareth, how he had been healing the sick, feeding thousands of people from a, a small lunch, how he had been uh, calming storms and walking on water and healing those afflicted with leprosy and all kinds of diseases. And they had heard about how he had even raised people back to life, such as Lazarus, a close friend of Jesus, who had been dead for four days when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And of course, they had heard his teachings, his amazing, astonishing teachings that went to the spirit of the law, uh, God's grace and love and forgiveness and mercy. And they had heard that Jesus was just now coming into the city and they wanted to make him king. They wanted him to become their Messiah, their deliverer, their political military ruler. Jesus knew all about this, but he also knew what would really happen to him. He knew that one of his own would betray him. He knew that he would be mocked and tortured. He knew that he would be executed by crucifixion. And he knew that after he was buried, he would be raised from the dead. But he got on the colt of a donkey and he went into the city anyway. Why? Why did Jesus come to Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey? Back in the time of David, his ancestor, some 900 years prior to his entrance in Jerusalem, into Jerusalem on that day, uh, David had begun uh, what became a uh, tradition, it's thought, where instead of horses, uh, instead of chariots, uh, the king and the royal officials in Jerusalem would use donkeys as a way of, if you will, public transportation. Donkeys were more uh, tame and uh, smaller. They were easy to mount and get off. They were also viewed as uh, uh, animals of peace and uh, not of war. David began what Jesus fulfilled. In other words, as it was prophesied, a son of David would come to Israel, would come to Jerusalem and set up a kingdom that would never end. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he came with humility. He came in peace and he came as a direct descendant of King David. Jesus 
succeeded. Although it looked like everything was crushed in terms of his uh, ministry and the, the new uh, kind of religion that he was bringing, the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament teachings and the words of the prophets and in fulfillment of all the prophecies about the coming Messiah were all fulfilled in Jesus. And yet, it all looked to be defeated and crushed when he was crucified. And yet, you know, we know, and we celebrate on Easter Sunday next week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, showing his complete victory over the powers of sin and death and wickedness and evil. Jesus came to set up an entirely different kind of kingdom. And he came as the angel had spoken to Joseph in a dream just before Jesus' birth. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means God who saves. When Jesus is trusted in, when you or I or anyone places our trust in Jesus Christ, believing him to be God's son, humanly a physical descendant from David, divinely conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. When we believe that Jesus was incarnated and became one of us and died for us, paying the penalty for our sins that we should have paid, we become citizens, if you will, of a different kind of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus knew what would happen when he rode into the city on the colt of a donkey. He knew that he would never leave the city again alive. And yet he rode on into the city anyway. You recall that Jesus had promised his disciples, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not withstand its building. That is, as the church of Jesus Christ grows and spreads, the kingdoms of evil and hell will not be able to contain it and defeat it and overcome it. Instead, it will be the other way around. Jesus' kingdom will never end and it will never be defeated. And you and I and anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as God's Son and Savior are children of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, family members, sons and daughters, princes and princesses uh, in God's kingdom, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Not only is Jesus' kingdom an eternal kingdom, and not only is Jesus' kingdom a kingdom that cannot be overcome by any power, it's also a kingdom whose citizens cannot be destroyed or overcome by any physical illness. No disease, no human condition, no virus can separate us as the Bible promises can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So friends, I'm in my office at First Presbyterian Church Montrose giving a sermon to a camera. You may be in, in a home or the home of a friend or your own home. Uh, and because of the COVID-19 quarantines and mandates regarding social distancing, here we are uh, in this modality. And I want to encourage us all that however long the COVID-19 pandemic uh, runs its course, however long that takes, it cannot defeat us. It cannot gain the ultimate victory that it seeks biologically to destroy, uh, to cause sickness. Nothing can overcome the souls of the children of God, all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior 
and Lord. Jesus rode into the city, but he rode into Jerusalem to set up a different kind of kingdom, not a military political kingdom, but a kingdom of spiritual power and victory and triumph, the kingdom of God. Jesus never said he was going into Jerusalem to conquer Pilate or Herod or Caesar or Rome. He never said he was going to take office in downtown Jerusalem and set up a administration and give positions in his administration to others. Even though his disciples had approached him and said, Lord, grant it that, that we may sit on your right hand and on your left hand. How did Jesus respond to those requests? He said, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom payment, a payment for moral debts, a payment for our sins. That's why Jesus came into Jerusalem and he succeeded. It cost him his very life, but through his death and burial and resurrection, he gained the ultimate victory and established a kingdom that rules eternally and it rules the world over. I want to look back at one of the verses that was read earlier. It's verse 11 in Mark chapter 11. And it says, that is Mark wrote, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And listen uh, to this particular part of verse 11 in Mark chapter 11. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Jesus rode in to the acclaim and the cheers and the shouting and the homage of thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem for the annual feast of the Passover. He went in to the city and he looked around at everything. He looked around at everything. And then he left to come back the next day. What did he see when he looked around at everything? What would Jesus have looked at? What would he have seen? Well, he would have seen people preparing for the Passover uh, rituals, the sacrifices. He would have seen people going into the temple area and having to change whatever currency they brought from some Roman province in a different part of the Roman Empire of the world. Uh, and they would have to change the money into a temple currency. And of course, to do that, they had to pay a rate or a fee to change their currency. And they had to buy animals that met the qualifications, the religious ceremonial qualifications for uh, sacrificing. And the prices, it is uh, thought, were uh, raised. And uh, for many, uh, it was not possible for them to afford such sacrifices. And some had to borrow money. And in order to borrow money, they had to pay fees to do that. Jesus came into the city and he looked around at everything. And he saw people who were weary and heavily burdened by the requirements of the religious ceremonial laws that had been handed down over the centuries and how expensive it was to try to meet all the requirements of the laws and how oppressive it was. And Jesus saw people who couldn't even afford the lowliest of sacrifices, buying a dove when a sheep or a bull would have been preferred. Jesus came into Jerusalem. He looked around at everything, and then he came back. And here's what happened when he came back, as was read earlier. 
The next day on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you, referring to all those running their businesses in the temple uh, grounds and courts, but you've made it a den of robbers. Jesus looked at everything and he saw the hearts of those longing for forgiveness, longing for the assurance of God's pardon from their sins and hoping for salvation, to be saved from the penalty of sins. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and entered into the temple courts and into the temple to clean house, to clean up the mess that the people had made of religion. And he came to set things right. He came into his father's house to clean up the wickedness and the injustice and the oppression that was existing there. And he came to set people free. He came to save those who would trust in him. Here's how those in positions of power responded. Reading from Mark chapter 11, verse 18. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. How ironic that the one that John the Baptist pointed to and acclaimed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world came into the city riding on a donkey in humility and in peace to offer his own life as a payment, as a ransom payment for the penalty of our sins and become the Lamb of God, the Passover sacrificial lamb. And what happened? In spite of his coming, his presentation of his life, he was arrested, he was betrayed, he was tortured, he was mocked, and eventually after suffering and crucifixion, Jesus Christ was executed and buried in the grave of someone who loaned the grave to his family. Next week, we celebrate, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story when Jesus is raised from the dead because his death was sufficient, his payment was accepted, his sinless, spotless, pure, holy life covers the sins of all of us who deserve to pay the penalty for our own sins. Here's a question I have for you at, at this time and all those who may be listening. You and I have a gate, and I'm not talking about the gate that may be in your yard or somewhere near your house, but we have a doorway to our hearts. And as the scriptures say in another verse, Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with them, and they will dine with me. In other words, those who open their souls, their lives, to the one who seeks to come in to our lives, into our families, into our church, into our communities, Jesus said, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. A question, is your door open? Are you willing to let Jesus come in? And if you've already made that decision, trusting Jesus as your Savior and Lord, 
and have become a child of God, uh, are you opening the other doors inside your heart, inside your life, where maybe you've been in control, but where Jesus wants to enter in and to be the Lord, um, the one who directs your life and leads you and empowers you to do God's will. May this Palm Sunday be a time of renewal for all of us as we are doing church, as it were, in, in an entirely different way. Maybe this Palm Sunday and, and the days to come leading up to Resurrection Sunday will be a time in which you draw closer to the Lord and allow the Lord to draw closer to you. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to set up an entirely different kind of kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, but a kingdom that overcomes all, a kingdom that cannot be defeated by any human condition, such as the pandemic of COVID-19. And Jesus offers, he doesn't force his way in, but he offers to come into our lives and to cleanse and to transform and to renew and to set us free to love God with all our being and neighbor as self. Jesus comes to heal. Jesus comes to comfort. And Jesus comes to assure us that no matter how we feel about all the things that are going on around us, in spite of the quarantines and the social distancing and the, the stay-at-home orders, Jesus comes to be with us, promising, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and the Lord will bless you. A promise from Proverbs uh, chapter 3. Have a blessed Palm Sunday, and thanks for viewing uh, and tuning in today. God bless you and your family. Stay healthy and stay focused on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to save us from our sins.